Good morning. Welcome to today's PACE webinar on special education in California. My name is Jeannie Myung. I am the Director of Policy Research at PACE, and I was the Project Director of the PACE Policy Research Panel on Special Education, which you'll hear about today. This is the second in a three-part webinar series in which you'll hear from a stellar group of researchers on special education practices and systems in our state. In the chat box, you should be able to find a link to the page on the PACE website with the 13 studies that were released last month. I'll summarize some of the high level takeaways from the set of studies before we dig deeper into the issue of teacher capacity. In summary, um, we found that California has a long way to go when it comes to meeting the learning needs of kids with disabilities who account for approximately 12% of the state's students. And um, though early intervention has been shown to have long-term benefits, students are not always identified for the services they need. After comparing students with similar needs for academic assistance, students of all racial ethnic subcategories are identified for special education at a lower rate in California than national averages. <clears throat> the inclusion of students with disabilities in general education settings is an important predictor of a range of positive outcomes, but California has one of the lowest inclusion rates in the country. In inclusive placements, students spend most of their day alongside peers without disabilities under the instruction of general education teachers, thus improving the educational experiences and outcomes of students with disabilities hinges on the capacity of both general and special education teachers to meet student learning needs. However, our research shows that teachers in both categories are underprepared. We will unpack this issue and potential paths forward in today's webinar. Other findings from our research include that many of the mental and physical health services that would benefit students with disabilities that are available in schools in other states are not available in California schools. The learning of students with disabilities and all students um, would be facilitated by the comprehensive implementation of multi-tiered systems of support, MTSS, um, a framework that aligns academic, behavioral, and social emotional learning in an integrated system. Effective use of evidence-based practices in the MTSS framework has the potential to provide the supports that students need when they need it. But in California, the system is not adequately resourced to implement MTSS reliably at scale. Uh, and lastly, transitions into and out of special education services can be confusing and burdensome for families and students. So this is, and this is especially true of the transition between infant toddler services and preschool, as well as into between and out of identification categories in K-12, and also transitions to life post school for students. Uh, a recording slide summary and Q&A from the webinar we had last week on this issue of transitions in special education is available on the PACE website. In terms of steps forward for California, a few key findings emerged from the set of studies. Some of these will be touched upon shortly. Uh, first, we must establish positive expectations and mindsets around inclusion of students with disabilities and their success. We must make a robust investment in the capacity of special and general education teachers and administrators to meet the needs of students with disabilities. A significant reoccurring theme across the studies is the need to systematize and communicate transparent data on services and outcomes for students with disabilities. And finally, effective service delivery and support for students with disabilities is only possible through interagency collaboration between the states multiple child serving systems. So uh, four of our authors from the PACE Policy Research Panel on Special Education will present on what it will take to develop educator capacity to meet the learning needs of students with disabilities. So I'm delighted to have with us today um, our panelists. We have um, Rachel Lambert, who is Assistant Professor in Special Education Mathematics Education at the Gevertz Graduate School of Education at UC Santa Barbara. We'll start us off by describing instruction that supports the learning of students with disabilities. And Rachel will be using the math classroom as the setting to discuss classroom instruction we want to see for all students. Naomi Andrasik is senior researcher and policy advisor at the Learning Policy Institute, and she will describe the extent of the special education teacher shortage 
explanatory factors and potential solutions California will need to take to develop a cadre of education specialists prepared to meet the unique learning needs of students with disabilities. And as I mentioned earlier, providing the educational experiences and outcomes for students with disabilities will depend on the capacity of both special education teachers and general education teachers to meet student learning needs. So we have Jacob Kirksey, PhD candidate also at the Gabbard's Graduate School of Education at UC Santa Barbara, who will discuss pre-service training in California to prepare general education teacher candidates to teach students with disabilities in inclusive settings. And finally, we'll have Aubin Stommer, professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at UC Davis to discuss effective professional development for educators to improve their practice to meet the needs of students with disabilities. So just a few logistical points before I turn it over to our authors. On your Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A box. Uh, you may need to move your cursor around to find it, but please do type questions that you have for our presenters into that box. If you don't get a response through the Q&A box, we may get to your question at the end of the webinar. And if questions remain, our authors will respond to questions in writing after the webinar and responses will be posted to the PACE website. So please do type in questions you have for our panelists into the Q&A box, even if we may not get to them today. Um, and in our chat box, you'll find links from Sean Bernardo to the PACE briefs that are being um, presented by the author. So thanks for doing that, Sean. And um, I'll also note that the slides and recording of this webinar will be posted to the PACE website as well. So with that, um, I'm pleased to turn it over to Rachel Lambert, who will talk us through an instruction designed to meet the needs of diverse math learners. Thank you. Very excited to be here and be part of this. We're going to start with the classroom and what the classroom can look like in sort of a new vision of what math education could be for students with disabilities as we move towards inclusion in California. So the first thing that we need to think about is what is the problem? The problem often in terms of mathematics for students with disabilities represented here by the dashboard is seen as a problem of achievement. And in terms of achievement, we have um, really significant gaps, gaps for students with disabilities in mathematics across California. Um, and so we might look for cognitive deficits and a lot of research does that. In my work, I situate the problem somewhere differently. I'm wondering whether students with disabilities have access to challenging mathematics. And when I'm thinking about challenging mathematics, I'm thinking about the California Common Core State Standards. So these standards are extremely rigorous, yet more focused on core ideas. They have increased engagement in problem solving and discussion. So we're asking students with disabilities to be able to, oh, sorry, um, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. The, we're asking students with disabilities to engage more in discussion and problem solving, and we're going to need to um, engage those students in general education classrooms to make sure they have access to that. Because what we have found is that students with disabilities do not have access to standard-based mathematics to an equal extent in segregated special education classrooms. And there's even been research that showed that students with disabilities, when included, are sometimes offered less rigorous problem solving, um, problems are simplified for them. And so this access to challenge and to rigor and to problem solving and discussion is a pervasive problem in California schools. So what does the research say? There is a huge difference uh, between the research on special education mathematics and general education mathematics. And if you look at my policy brief, I have a lot of citations in this area so you can explore this uh, more deeply. Basically, Special education research is focused on replication of existing findings. Those existing findings are typically about direct instruction. So much of that research has been about replication of those findings, leaving out uh, research on inquiry mathematics, problem solving, discussion, core ideas. And so there's a whole body of research that we don't have right now about mathematics and students with disabilities. Um, so, uh, what I am going to bring to you is a different research base, which is UDL. So it's a different way to look at it. Instead of some kind of difference between direct instruction and inquiry-based instruction, it basically takes the strategic learning part of inquiry-based instruction and includes every, thinks about how we can include all kids within this. So let's move to the next slide. So universal design for learning is the idea that um, if we see classrooms as spaces where a wide range of kids can excel and thrive. So if you are blind, you can excel and thrive. If you have intellectual disabilities, it's a place you can be included meaningfully. If you have dyslexia, it's a place you can be included meaningfully. 
Um, and so to design thinking about these sort of range and designing from the edges. Um, it emerged from a universal design, which was a movement in product design and architecture that was actually led by disabled um, architects. And it is uh, grounded in sort of two kinds of science. So it's, it has a very strong research base in first the learning sciences. So the science and how individuals learn and grow in complex fields. Um, and that, in that way, the goal is developing expert strategic learners. The second scientific area is neuro, uh, neuroscience. So one idea that really pervades UDL is learner variability. That's the idea that um, we don't, there's no normal brain and then everybody else's brain. All of our brains are different. All of our brains vary. So how do we use that scientific evidence? How do we design instruction around that? Um, instead of the one size fits all that is far more prevalent in our schools and in math instruction. So uh, the one thing I wanted to say before we moved on in terms of UDL, there's a, what, a lot of what UDL is, is empathy. So it's designing around how the learning experience feels and thus how a kid can take in or not take it in. So we're gonna jump right into the next slide. This is a quote from a, um, an individual, an African-American student with a learning disability growing up in New York City. Um, he, he says in an interview, like math, I could be right in the front row getting all the information, but it doesn't click right away in your head. I mean, you're staring at it, but it's not there at that moment while everyone else, it clicks to them real fast. After a while, you're just standing there and pause, just looking at the example and it's not feeding it to your brain. And I wanna do a second quote from another individual with uh, dyslexia. There was the nightmare of the multiplication tables. It wasn't the concept of multiplying that I had trouble with. It was memorizing the tables and then having to retrieve them quickly. I was not actually doing math. I was doing rapid naming, which is a process that can create tremendous hurdles for dyslexic readers throughout their lives. Can we go to the next slide? So um, just those two very quick snippets help us sort of enter into this idea of what it's like from in math classroom, in a one size fits all math classroom for students with disabilities. One is that there's limited avenues for learning. So that the, there's something written on this board, this really old fashioned board that I have this image of for you. And you're supposed to sit there and take in the mathematics. Um, and I think we know that that doesn't really work. And it especially doesn't work for students who that modality doesn't work for. The uh, focus is on speed and memorization. And that's particularly disabling for students who have issues with memory and who have issues with speed. Um, so classrooms that are focused on that are gonna naturally like disable a wide variety of students with disabilities and without disabilities. The uh, instruction that they're describing is about memorization, not about concepts. And that's additionally troublesome for kids. And then this is the last one. And then finally, how important the emotional aspects of mathematics are. So one of the, the neuroscience principles that UDL is designed around is that engagement really matters. So let's go to the next slide where we talk about that. First is, we know that kids uh, need to feel um, safe and comfortable learning in order to be able to learn. So how do we make that happen in the mathematics classroom? How do we make sure that they're fully engaged so that they can cognitively engage so that they can learn? Um, so we need to develop safe classroom communities. We need to shift away from mathematical speed towards valuing mathematical thinking and persistence. In my research in inclusive classrooms, I found that students, teachers are able to do that and students in interviews are able to tell me that freed them up to participate. Uh, knowing that it was okay to make a mistake and knowing it was okay to take a long time. We need to make sure mathematics classes are relevant. We need to make sure there's choice and agency for students in these classrooms. And then the second um, aspect of UDL is representation. The representation is what do we take in? What modality is it in? How does that matter? So in mathematics, I'm gonna argue there's two things we need to think about specifically. First is core ideas. Um, all too often, mathematics instruction is kind of focused on the corollary ideas instead of the, folk, the ideas that should be the focus, um, like the memorization of multiplication facts rather than what is multiplication, how does it work, and how does that connect to algebra? That's a core idea that matters along the continuum of math learning. So we need to focus all, everything around core ideas. We have to offer practice. We have to offer review that helps students um, consolidate these kinds of important mathematical ideas. And then secondly, representation of ideas need to be multimodal. This gives access to students who have different kinds of um, visual or you know, hearing impairments 
And it also offers access to kids who need different ways to think about mathematical ideas, such as number lines. And those representations always need to be connected purposefully in the math classroom. The last um, pillar of UDL is strategic action. And so this is how we think. This is really important in UDL because it underlies what we want to develop in our learners, which is strategic, purposeful, expert learners. So to be able to do that, we need to support their strategic develop, strategy development, sometimes in a, more, um, in a more scaffolded way than we have done in the past. Um, we need to offer routines, um, problem solving routines, focused ways of discussion. Basically, we need to like teach the skills you need to be a good math learner to all of our students because everybody needs it. But we need to do that a little more actively so that we can make sure that kids who have, may have some difficulties with executive functioning can also engage in that kind of strategic thinking. So finally, I am so happy I have time to get to my policy recommendations, yay! Um, which is, what can we do in schools in general? So the first is that we really need to provide more professional development in California on the Common Core State Standards and the kids' connections to UDL, um, and focus on special educators who are often not given this kind of training in mathematics in their credential programs and for administrators so that the, everyone can see these connections and how uh, UDL can help all of our kids be included rather than using math as a sort of an excuse to exclude or to track, which happens a lot. We need to invest in tier one instruction using UDL, UDL as a design framework. A lot of places are working really hard in their tier two, tier three, and those things are important, but we need to invest in tier one so that the majority of kids can get there um, can be educated in what I call in the essay least restrictive curriculum, which is the curriculum that is there for all kids to become like mathematical learners. We need to connect IEP goals to the California Common Core State Standards, particularly the SMPs. There's a lot of work going on in the state at the county level, at the district level with math coaches and other administrators who are working on trying to connect IEP goals more specifically to problem solving, discussion and engagement and access in the math classroom. And then lastly, we need more research that is about students with disabilities in inclusive classrooms learning mathematics rather than research that has those students in separate settings. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. First of all, I wanna make sure to acknowledge my LPI colleagues who co-authored the report with me. That's uh, Desiree Carver-Thomas, Catlin Scott, um, and Linda Darling-Hammonds. And of course, I wanna thank Pace for pulling together this webinar and the overall series on special education. So our corner of this series on, on special education in California was to look at the shortage of special education teachers in the state. Our goals were to provide an update on the status, let me move this out of the way. Just realized that might be blocking everyone's view. Um, we wanted to provide an update on the status of the shortage uh, by analyzing, among other things, CTC data on teacher credentials. And we also wanted to make sure that we identified some of the factors that may be contributing to the attrition of special education teachers. And we did that using a couple of approaches. We did a literature review to look at prior research on this topic. And we also pulled together a focus group of special educators uh, with the help of the California Teachers Association. So before I jump into what our findings were, I wanna make sure that we start with a little bit of the why, why it matters that we consider the shortage and look at ways of addressing it. But to do that, I think we need to look at what's happening really quickly with what's happening with students with disabilities in the state. First of all, statewide testing data show that achievement gaps have grown across multiple grade levels in both uh, English language arts and mathematics. And if you look at the most recently released list of county offices of ed and school districts that are eligible for differentiated assistance, what you'll see is that over half of those entities were identified on the basis of poor outcomes for students with disabilities. So there's clearly some work that needs to be done on looking at what our options are for improving outcomes for this particular student group. So where do special educators fall into this equation? Well, if you look at the research, you find that the special educators who have more extensive preparation are able to boost achievement for students with disabilities. They're also better prepared to use a range of instructional methods, which is key when you consider that students with disabilities come in not only with a range of needs, but also with a wide range of strengths and assets. 
And then finally, better prepared special educators are less likely to turn over, which we also know is critical for improving student outcomes. So what does the shortage look like? Well, if you look at the most recent year of data, what you'll see is that nearly 5,000 incoming special educators came into the field underprepared. Now, I'm talking about folks represented in this red box here. These are people coming in on substandard credentials and permits. One of the key takeaways from this chart is that two out of every three new special educators are coming into the field underprepared, and that's the greatest proportion of any major subject area. And uh, about one last thing is about half of those underprepared teachers are coming in on emergency style permits and waivers, which means that they're coming in without teacher preparation or having demonstrated subject matter competence. So I just spent a few minutes talking about the supply side of things, but to really understand the shortage, we also have to think about what's happening in terms of demand. With the data available to us, we weren't able to calculate turnover rates for California's special education teachers at traditional schools, but we were able to look at turnover for teachers working in special education schools. And what you find is that over 20% of them, more than one out of every five, are left their positions between the 2016 and 2017 school years. That's a turnover rate that exceeds what you see in other subject areas. It's also reflective of what you see in national data, which show higher attrition rates for special educators compared to teachers in other subject areas. So what are some of the factors that could be driving special educators out of the field? One of the things we know is that preparation matters. In California, teachers coming in on substandard credentials and permits leave at about twice the rate of those who come in fully prepared. And this ends up creating a leaky bucket problem where you have teachers who come in, but because they're underprepared, they only end up staying for a few years and they're out of the field. One evidence-based way to combat this issue is through intensive preparation and professional learning experiences that improve not only teacher retention, but also improve teacher efficacy. And research shows that uh, you know, certain experiences like having access to student teaching opportunities, uh, receiving mentorship from an expert teacher who has expertise in special education, these are ways to improve teacher retention. One final thing to consider is the historical context of special educator preparation in the state. California used to require special educators to obtain both a general education and a special education credential, but that dual credentialing requirement went away in 1996. What we have now is teachers can finish their preparation in nine months, um, and that often is through an internship program where they don't have an opportunity to student teach. In contrast, if you look at what other states are doing, special educators continue to get dual preparation in gen ed and special ed uh, with extensive coursework and student teaching. In a lot of places, the way this uh, shows up is that um, special educators will get a gen ed credential and then they'll layer on top of that uh, master's in special education. Of course, we also know from our focus group and from the research that working conditions are critical, a critical factor impacting special educators' decisions to remain or leave, remain in or leave the field. In particular, special educators, both in our focus group and nationally, say that high maintenance caseloads are a key stressor. In California, uh, state law does not do a whole lot to uh, address the caseload issue. We do have a state law that limits a caseload to 28 students, but that only applies to a very narrowly defined type of special educator, and caseloads can actually exceed 32 students with approval of a state waiver. Other states do more to mitigate caseload, uh, for example, by varying caseload limits by student need or by the type of setting that teachers are working in. And then, of course, in addition to caseload, uh, we found from our focus group and from the research that Special educators say that support from their gen ed colleagues and administrators are critical and that a lack of support impacts their decisions to stay in the field. Finally, financial supports are key um, for influencing recruitment and retention. We know from national data that special education teachers who leave the field say that low salaries are a reason that they left. Um, and then we also know that student debt can uh, 
have an impact on the pipeline at the very beginning. It deters people from pursuing teacher careers. It diverts them towards higher paying careers. These are important points to consider, especially in a state like California, where we have some regions that are especially um, very expensive to live in and difficult for teachers to make ends meet. So what has the state done to address the teacher shortage? First off, I'll point out that the state is currently considering some historic investments in the educator workforce with $900 million in proposals. We'll have to wait to see what happens with those, but in the meantime, we can look at prior years to see how the state has begun to address shortages across subject areas, including special education. Uh, prior investments include money for special education teacher residencies and a local solutions grant program for uh, special, education, special educator shortages. And last year, the state also created the Golden State uh, Scholarship Program, which will issue $20,000 scholarships to teacher candidates who commit to teaching in shortage areas, including special education. There were also a couple of programs, the Educator Workforce Investment Grant and the School Leadership Academy, which were established to build the state's infrastructure for delivering professional learning opportunities to educators in the state. So, of course, we expect that these efforts will ultimately help the state make progress in addressing the special educator shortage, but one thing to note is that aside from that leadership academy, all of those investments that were on that preceding chart were made on a one-time basis, and they were also made relatively recently, so it's going to take time to see those results. Right now, the shortage is severe and students with disabilities need access to well-prepared special educators if they're going to succeed. But uh, again, many students don't have access to that today when you consider that two of every three incoming special educators are entering the field underprepared. So what can we do? One uh, strategy is to strengthen the pipeline with uh, recruitment incentives that draw folks into high retention pathways like teacher residencies or grow your own programs. One example of a grow your own program uh, is the classified uh, school employee credentialing program, which has been funded previously by the state. It's one of the proposed uh, proposals on the table this year as well. Um, and we can also look at ways to support uh, candidates, teacher candidates, in ways that reduce their debt accrual through things like teacher scholarships. We can look at ways to improve access to high quality preparation and professional development. The state could consider options for improving access uh, using infrastructure that it's already uh, currently building, for example, the Educator Workforce Investment Grant. In particular, you know, looking at ways to provide access to uh, professional learning opportunities that we know from the research are tied to improved efficacy and teacher retention, like high quality mentoring and job embedded coaching. We can look at ways to improve working conditions for special educators. The state and districts can consider how to revise, for example, caseload expectations and provide additional administrative support. And then finally, increase compensation. Um, it, with increased funding for special education, for example, what happened last year in the state budget and what's on the table this year, those kinds of investments can help relieve the financial pressures that districts say they're experiencing, put them in a better position to uh, increase compensation and support their, their special educators. So that's the end of my presentation. Thanks all for listening. And if you'd like additional information on teacher shortages in the state, please feel free to visit our website. I'll be talking about um, on the preparation side of um, what the situation looks like with how we're preparing um, new teachers to support changing co compositions of classrooms. We're seeing more students with learning disabilities in general education now more than ever before. So um, our work looks at how these teachers are being prepared and what might associate with these teachers feeling um, stronger abilities to help teach these students and support inclusion. So a little bit of the policy context. We know that um, accountability wise, schools and teachers are being held accountable for um, educating students with disabilities in general. Um, this includes the largest proportion of these students, which is students with specific learning disabilities. Um, and we see this both through IDEA, which has been around for a while, but also through recent reauthorization of No Child Left Behind, which incorporated um, accountability expectations and um, same was true for under ESSA. Um, and just to give you an idea for, you know, specifics on how these classrooms are changing, 
the largest group that has made the transition from um, special education only classrooms to general education are students with learning disabilities. Um, we've seen this number jump by 68% in two decades. Um, and just a reminder, you know, the end goal is that all students, students with and without learning disabilities are making yearly academic progress, which then raises questions about how general education teachers are being prepared to educate both um, sets of needs. Policy context for teacher preparation is also looking a bit different. Um, with regards to educating students with learning disabilities, these teachers and their preparation programs are undoubtedly facing pressure to ensure that these students are indeed uh, making adequately yearly progress. Um, and as a result, teacher preparation programs, both through accreditation process and general policy um, conversations are at the forefront of ensuring that this preparation is indeed happening. The challenge here though is that traditionally in preparation programs, preparation for general education teachers has been seen entirely separately from preparation to see teach students with disabilities. And so now programs are having to consolidate and figure out the best ways um, to incorporate all of this preparation that we know is good teaching for general education teachers. One of the ways California and many other states are proposing to do this is adding additional licensure requirements. Um, the teacher performance assessments in California, EdTPA being one of them, have recently gone a lot of traction. They are required um, at the end of a teacher's preparation process um, to be passed for them to receive their credential. Briefly, an overview of teacher performance assessments, EdTPA in particular, this is a, um, a formal standardized assessment that, that purports to prepare all teacher candidates to be able to lead a classroom um, from day one. And so these candidates in EdTPA's context are uploading videos of their practice um, and um, reflecting on their practice and submit this to um, third party evaluators. Um, EdTPA particularly has certain rubrics that um, look at preparation for students with learning disabilities. And so that raises our interest here. Um, and then in general, very quickly, how these teacher performance assessments sort of mesh with existing California um, policy with regards to teacher preparation programs. Teacher preparation programs, their format, so to speak, um, is the teacher performance expectations. These are a set of standards that the California um, Commission on Teacher Credentialing has set um, for all teacher preparation programs and their candidates um, to meet the different criteria set out by these performance expectations. The idea is that these TPEs also go hand in hand with preparing for teaching performance assessments, which is that summative assessment at the end of the preparation process. Um, and, you know, when that may or may not be happening, but this is part of our interest in seeing what factors might indeed be helpful in preparing teachers to support inclusive classrooms. So our study looks at, um, or studies, has looked at three primary questions, which is how do pre-service teachers perceive themselves um, as ready to educate students with learning disabilities in general education? And then once they graduate, do these teachers, um, what qualities of their preparation program, such as coursework and field work or the performance assessment, do they feel linked to their abilities to educate students with learning disabilities and support general education? And then we're interested also in how these, these perceptions might differ for elementary versus secondary teachers. I'm gonna gloss over this just a little bit, but here's just some background literature for you to look at later. If you're interested in what's been done on teacher education specifically for students with learning disabilities, especially, and then more in the domain of teaching performance assessments later on. So I'm gonna talk about two studies that we did. Both were at the University of California teacher education programs. Um, seven campuses overall were included in these studies. The first study was actually a pilot at just one of these campuses. The second study looked at uh, all seven of these campuses. And our study involved giving a survey to teachers at the end of their preparation programs. And we asked them a slew of questions from their backgrounds in terms of demographics, um, as well as a series of questions about their preparation and their programs. Um, just so you have an idea of, you know, UCs do not prepare a vast majority of teachers in California. That is primarily, um, you know, private preparation programs or the CSUs. Um, but our demographics um, do look very similar to the California general um, labor supply of teachers. So here's just an illustration of those similarities in demographics. 
what we're interested in in looking for these teachers is are they prepared to provide general support for inclusive classrooms? This really gets at this piece of both educating students without disabilities, but also prepared to engage in variety of tasks that relate to educating students with disabilities, such as using IEPs um, and cooperating with special education teachers. The second thing we're interested in is looking at, are they prepared to use specific instructional strategies that we know are helpful for educating students with learning disabilities? Some of the background or the program characteristics, the factors that go into their preparation we surveyed were looking at the helpfulness of the teaching performance assessment, the alignment of the teaching performance assessment with the rest of the preparation process, their support from their university supervisor, whether they felt that their program was coherent, had a similar goal um, and vision for teaching and learning, and then their placement expectations. Did it fit with their expectations of what they wanted to see as a full-time teacher or what they had envisioned um, prior to being placed there? I'll leave this here for anybody's interested in the statistical analyses, um, but moving over into the results, to look at that first research question, which as a reminder is, how do these teachers feel? Do they feel prepared to provide general support or use instructional strategies in inclusive classrooms? This is from that second larger study. And we find that in general, um, in the various questions that really get at the general support to inclusive classrooms, which you can see over there on the right, um, we find that teachers did feel um, pretty positive about their abilities to provide general support to inclusive classrooms. There is variation, of course, um, but a majority of teachers as you can see, responded with agree, and then followed by strongly agree. The same was also true for using specific instructional strategies for students with learning disabilities. And you can see some of those different activities we asked them if they were prepared to use. <clears throat> so looking at specific to um, the second research question, which is what factors related to these different domains. So first, with regards to providing general support, we found that teacher candidates who felt that their programs were more coherent, had a consistent vision, used similar language and artifacts across the preparation process, were um, more likely to feel that they had um, policy knowledge, so the understanding of IDEA, the ability to use IEPs, um, provide that general aspect to support to inclusive classrooms. Also in study one, so this is the pilot study with a smaller sample, we found that those who felt that EdTPA or the teaching performance assessment was helpful also believed that um, they were more prepared to teach and educate students with learning disabilities using specific instructional strategies. When we scaled this up to the larger study, there were some similarities. Um, the first is um, looking in general, so the, um, providing general support and educating students with learning disabilities. Um, teachers who, again, felt that their programs were coherent, felt better prepared to support um, inclusive classrooms and teach specific using specific instructional strategies. We also found that um, teachers were more prepared to teach specific instructional strategies if they felt sh more strongly supported by their university supervisors in their field placement, which we felt made sense because that's where these teachers are learning to actually use these instructional strategies. Now to look at differences between elementary and secondary. Um, we found that all of our results were primarily for elementary teachers. Um, so all of these different characteristics I've talked about, they grew in magnitude when we took a specific focus on just the elementary candidates. Um, and we did not find any association or statistically meaningful relationship between these different factors I've talked about and secondary candidates, um, which we also feel um, makes sense as I'll get to in just a minute. So summarizing the main findings, we found that program coherence matters a lot. It mattered in a lot of the different um, ways we were looking at this. Um, and this, this really gets at defining a consistency in exposure um, to the different ways that the candidates are being prepared in their program. There's some literature cited there if you're interested. We also found some commonalities across helpfulness. So um, there is this um, notion that maybe those who have bought into the frameworks of the teaching performance assessments might perceive themselves as being better prepared to use specific instructional strategies. And then finally, the implication for the secondary candidates is what are we doing to prepare these candidates? Um, 
it makes sense that our findings are focused on elementary candidates because these are the individuals who will see the same students all day, um, know the student's name, you know, probably by the second week of school at least, hopefully even sooner, whereas these secondary candidates are going to see um, potentially hundreds of students in their classrooms. And so thinking about the efficacy of their ways to support students with specific learning disabilities might be a bit more daunting. But I think this um, tasks us with figuring out are there ways that we can reassure these candidates in their preparation and efficacy to support these students and in inclusion. And then finally, one last note in thinking about this in the policy context of EdTPA and other um, forms of traction that the, the state has put a lot of emphasis on, you know, EdTPA in particular, um, and some of the teaching performance assessments are really geared at streamlining the preparation process. Again, I'll go back to these assessments purport to prepare teachers um, to gain the knowledge and skills that they need from day one in the classroom. And so in some ways, you can see these, these tools of preparation is potentially trying to increase coherence within a program, add consistency within programs, have faculty and um, directors of programs speak similar language and use similar artifacts across their courses. And so this sort of, I think, argues we need a better understanding of ways that EdTPA um, in particular may be um, increasing coherence in programs or um, there's some prior research showing it actually is doing quite the opposite. And so this is an area of research that needs to be pursued further. In conclusion, again, I'll just mention there are some clear limitations to this. Those who are interested in the study design can review some of these and certainly ask questions. Um, and I've talked about a few areas that I think are needed for um, next steps in future research. I want to acknowledge um, our funding source for this, a very big supporter, CTAR and the California Teacher Education Research and Improvement Network, which is a um, cross UC campus collaboration um, that has done, is doing some great work. Um, so I encourage you to look into CTARN if you aren't unfamiliar with it. Thank you. My name is Avin Steamer, uh, as you heard, and I want to acknowledge my co-collaborators, Kelsey Oliver and Patty Shetter, who helped develop this information. I'm going to talk a little bit about recommendations for professional development across teachers, administrators, and school personnel. You heard earlier about the math achievement gap. I think you're going to find nice consistencies in our presentations. Um, we have this California Schools dashboard, which has also shown a light on our students with disabilities. Uh, about 12% of students in the California system, over 700,000 qualify for special education and have an identified disability. And according to the California dashboard, students with disabilities are in the orange or the red in almost all areas, including English, math, college and career preparation, um, and absenteeism and graduation rates. So only about 10% are prepared for life after school, which is a challenge. Um, these gaps are likely even greater for the very high proportion of students with disabilities who also live in poverty, foster care, or English language learners. So in order to support those students better, we think that professional development can really promote the use of evidence-based practices so that, uh, which then can lead to improved student outcomes. The other advantage is um, that high quality professional development, mentoring and support really increase teacher retention and that might help address some of the attrition and teacher shortage challenges in special education. So here are our thoughts and recommendations in this area. Um, the first is that teachers, all teachers need content about high incidence disabilities. Teachers report to us that they feel ill-equipped and underprepared to support students with disabilities, both in specialized and inclusive settings. Um, so you see that quote from the general education teacher, we spent too much time reading about students with disabilities, but not enough on how to structure the classroom to be individually responsive to student needs, which gets back to some things you heard earlier. Um, we know that, uh, as you can see from that figure, learning disabilities such as dyslexia and dysgraphia are the most common qualifying disabilities, followed by speech language impairment, autism, and other health impairment, which is primarily ADHD. So we know that many of the students in these high incidence 
uh, disabilities have the uh, cognitive skills and learning skills to be included in a regular education environment and use the general education curriculum, which means it's really important for general education teachers to understand their challenges, their strengths, and um, understand the disabilities generally so that they can support these students. So our recommendation in this area is to conduct basic introductory training for all educators in high incidence disabilities so they understand the common strengths and learning needs. The second area that's really important is um, attitudes and beliefs about evidence-based practice and inclusion. Research very strongly tells us that teachers who are open to learning new things are more likely to welcome training and coaching and to use those practices successfully. There may be, um, we know there are actually educators with unconscious bias that interferes with their willingness to use evidence-based practice and their um, willingness to include uh, students with different learning abilities in their classrooms. For example, some of the things um, that teachers tell us when we ask them about it is that they might have a belief that students with disabilities have such significant academic and behavioral challenges that they can't be served in regular education. Uh, they may believe that including students with disabilities compromises the education of their other students in the classroom. They may not feel uh, that these students are their responsibility or that they have the skills needed to educate those students effectively. Um, and these beliefs can often lead to punitive um, practices and um, attributing behavior and learning challenges to the student's sort of attitude, oppositional behavior, rather than understanding the disorder. So we think that PD should focus on overcoming these unconscious biases and improving the understanding of cultural, neurological, and environmental causes of challenging behaviors as well as learning deficits so that there really is an understanding about why we want to include all students. We often think about training, didactic training, train and hope um, as something that is our usual way of training and these methods have really not led to improved practices or improved student outcomes. Um, you can see in this figure there's a, a little bit of a gap between not knowing and knowing, but the gap between knowing and actually being able to do something is, is pretty wide. Um, people don't often generalize their skills from a training into the classroom without some uh, coaching and mentorship and a greater experience in evidence-based practices. And oftentimes the people doing the training are really great at that evidence-based practice and have expertise with kids, but don't understand adult learning practices. And so we really need to help um, in, improve sustainment of all we're spending on these professional development opportunities by using uh, evidence-based adult learning practices to teach the teachers what they need to know, uh, as well as job embedded coaching. Even teachers who have incredible attitudes toward evidence-based practice and inclusion need high quality training, coaching and feedback um, to perform successfully. We also need to be able to um, link what they're learning to the district and state performance goals so that it's relevant. Um, and we want to look at PD effectiveness as much as we look at student outcomes. Is this working? So we're using um, good practices that are cost effective. It's also important, we think, to include paraprofessionals in professional development because they are doing a lot of the support. So what does high quality professional development look like? And there are lots of publications about this. Um, but we start with information and then move quickly up to training, coaching, feedback, and support from leaders. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then for sustainment, the consultation and support and performance-based evaluation needs to be ongoing. Um, professional learning communities are one way teachers and professionals can support each other, as well as team-based problem solving and understanding how to do database decision-making about how this practice is working, both for the professional as well as for the student. And so, as you've heard, um, we would like to think about um, the multi 
multi-tiered system of support that's a framework that's often recommended by California to provide the necessary supports for all students based on their unique needs on this continuum from universally designed instruction to more highly intensive strategies. And one of the components of MTSS is that we use evidence-based practice in the context of response to intervention, which means database decision-making. Um, and so we want to think about um, putting the training and evidence-based practices into this context of the larger school system so that it's not one extra thing for teachers, but a way to integrate it into what they're already doing. And so this is a tiered system of support, as you heard earlier. Um, it includes the core school curriculum, positive behavior supports, UDL for about 80% of students, an, a um, small group instruction, more intensive for 15%, and then that tier three for students who need more intensive, perhaps one-on-one -on -one, um, instruction. And so our recommendation is that we provide, as you heard earlier, professional learning opportunities in tier one, how to implement UDL so that students don't need to move up a tier and all teachers feel comfortable supporting students with disabilities in their classrooms. Um, that we have tier two PD for staff um, who are going to be doing some more intensive group activities like intensive reading groups or social skills groups. And then tier three training for um, professionals who are specialist staff to uh, ensure that they're trained to implement the interventions that are needed, as well as to coach other staff and using those in the context of the classroom. So this is um, providing more support for those students who need it. But again, lots of training in tier one so that we can really avoid moving up those tiers. And then, uh, oh, I'm running out of time. So I wanna make sure we don't forget to train leaders um, in how to support their providers. Um, they need training in how to, to provide implementation support. Teachers and providers can't do it on their own. They need to learn how to put these evidence-based practices in the context of the system, measure them, and link the use back to the strategies and goals. And then I am done. <laughs> Thank you. So we do have a little bit of time for a couple questions. Um, thank you for all your very thoughtful questions. Um, there's a few that we could get to today. The ones that we don't get to today, we will uh, respond over the course of the week um, to ensure that your questions get addressed by our authors. Um, we do have a couple that are related to um, salaries for special education teachers. And I wonder if I could direct this one to you, um, Naomi, about um, what are the opportunities and barriers um, to increasing salaries for special education teachers in California? Um, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Got it, okay. Well, I think that, you know, if you spoke to people in districts, uh, the first thing that you would hear is that, uh, you know, many school districts feel like they're struggling with uh, under being under-resourced and underfunded, So that would probably be the first thing. Um, and then the other thing is that a lot of districts are dealing with um, high cost issues like teacher pensions and special education costs, especially rank at the top of uh, things that districts are struggling to pay for. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a challenge of resource allocation when you don't have enough resources in the first place. Okay, and then um, this, one probably also goes to you, Naomi, but other um, panelists feel free to respond. What do we know about the benefits of um, general education credentialing and master's degrees for special education teachers? Yeah, so um, in our report, we do talk about how other states do it and that some of them will layer special education on top of a gen ed credential. Um, I, you know, we don't recommend in our report that California necessarily go that route, but really what we try to get across is that having this dual preparation in gen ed and special ed is important, not only for special educators, but for general educators, because it uh, gives them the content knowledge and the skill sets they need to work with all students, and especially as California is moving towards, and the nation really is moving towards increasing inclusion, um, you know, because of all the evidence that 
shows that uh, that leads to better outcomes, especially for students with disabilities. Having teachers have that sort of, uh, you know, ground level knowledge um, of gen ed and special ed principles will be important to advance inclusion. Thank you, Naomi. Um, other thoughts from our panelists about this issue of dual credentialing? Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, we do have another question about um, classified school employee teacher preparation programs or um, support for working with students with disabilities for paraprofessionals. Um, I, is there um, any research or resources that you could direct our um, audience members to who are interested in learning more about that? Was the question about uh, the for training for paraprofessionals or for helping them advance towards becoming teachers if that's what they want to do? Oh, uh, you know, I think there's a question here about the classified school employee teacher preparation program in particular. Um, so maybe, maybe you could talk to that one too. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. So the California Teacher uh, Credentialing, the Commission on Teacher Credentialing just released a report actually that talks about the results from uh, prior rounds of funding for that program and the types of candidates they've been able to recruit uh, and where those candidates are currently in the pipeline so you can go to the CTC to access that report and get uh, really nice details about what the program has been able to accomplish. Um, I think that you know some quick stats on it. There are somewhere around 300 folks who have completed their credential through that program, and there are over a thousand additional folks in the pipeline currently. Um, and uh, you know when you hear Mary Sandy talk about this program, I, you know she's able to bring up a lot of numbers that highlight some you know, good evidence that the program has been successful at recruiting diverse candidates and getting them uh, through their teacher credentials. Okay, thank you, Naomi. Um, so I guess just in the interest of time, we'll um, close up the webinar today. Um, I just again want to thank Rachel. Naomi, Jacob, and Aubin for your research and your presentations and insights. Um, and I want to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I know you have busy schedules and we appreciate you taking the ch chance to um, hear about the research. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to do so already, please register for the next and final webinar in the series, which will be a good one coming up on Tuesday, March 10th, that will focus on developing the systems we need to put in place in California to support the kind of practices that you heard about Today, um, we'll discuss differentiated assistance, MTSS, interagency collaboration, and promising policies from other states. So thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you. you.